It is a great honor and a privilege to introduce Miriam Bracher Heimler. Thank you, Dr. Les Glasman, for giving me this opportunity to talk about a very important part of my life. I will not talk about my escape as an 11-year-old child from the communist East Germany to West Germany, because that takes that's another whole story which takes too long to tell now, but I wrote this in my book, Daughter of Abraham. What I will talk about today is my spiritual journey from the communist East Germany to Israel and to Yerushalayim. It's Erev Shavuot. When we read the book of Ruth, um, a non-Jewish woman at the time who followed her Jewish mother-in-law to Eretz Israel and converted to Judaism. Now my Jewish journey started when I was two years old in East Germany. We had a garden and we grow, grew uh, animals sheep and chicken, and once a year these animals were slaughtered and my mother prepared them and um, she wanted me to eat meat. She always put it on my plate and you can't believe how I screamed. I screamed. Uh, I didn't want to eat this meat. I always, she put it on my plate, I always put it back onto hers. I did not want to eat the strafe meat. But how did I know about Kashrut, about the Jewish dietary laws as a two-year-old? I'd never heard anything about the Jews. And again, when I was about eight or nine, I went to the former concentration camp of Buchenwald, where my school, um, my class went to have a tour. Now, Buchenwald is located on the Ettersburg, which um, is near Weimar, and my family uh, and the school, of course, also was not very far, just to maybe, I don't know, 150 kilometers from, from the Ettersburg. So, we got a tour through the former concentration camp of Buchenwald and we were told all about how many communists died there. It was incredible. They told us everything about the communists and the method how they were killed. There was not one word about Jews. Nothing was said about Jews. Although, out of the 56,000 communists or male, out of the male prisoners in Buchenwald, at least 11,000 were Jews. The first time I heard about Judaism was when I was 13 years old in my confirmation class, Christian confirmation class. So the pastor told us all about different religions. He, he talked about Christianity, he talked about the Muslims, he talked about the, the um, Hindus, the Buddhists, and he dictated the numbers to us. I've still written them down somewhere. And so, when he told us the number about the Jews, of the Jews, the number was so small. So, he also told us something about Judaism and that Christianity um, came out from Judaism, that Judaism was there before Christianity. 
and he told us all about Jesus and that Jesus um, was the Son of God and the Messiah and I still remember how I sat there at this long table and I was greatly puzzled. I didn't understand. Pastor, I wanted to say, if the Jews were there before the Christians and just because somebody believed that Jesus um, was the Son of God and the Messiah, but in fact, we are all Jews then, aren't we? That's our foundation, our source. So why are we not all Jews? But I didn't ask it. I was always so shy. But I remember walking home thinking, I'm a Jew. This is where I come from. And I walked up to my mother, I came home, and I wanted to tell her very excitedly, but she was so tired after a long day's hard work and wanted to get supper ready. So I kept this new discovery to myself. This was the first time I heard about Jews. And I'd like to light, this was the first spark, really, and I would like to light the first, no, the second candle. About the first candle, I will talk later. This was the second spark. Now I'm lighting this candle on a menorah that has very great significance to me. When I was in my early 20s, I lived in West Berlin. My family, my, my mother, my sister and I, we had come out when I was 11 out of East Germany and we lived in West Germany and I lived in West Berlin. So um, every day going to work and coming back from work, I walked by, I passed by an antique shop where I saw in the shop window this menorah and I fell in love with it. It was so beautiful. And I wanted to buy it, but I couldn't yet afford it. But I saved up and eventually I bought it. And this menorah has been with me now for the last 50 years. It's very interesting how one event, one experience follows the, the next. Shortly after this menorah was in my home, my mother came to visit me in Berlin. And I suggested to her to go to an exhibition. I knew there was a Holocaust exhibition in Berlin and my mother agreed. So we went to this exhibition and you can't imagine, I was horrified to see the cruelty and the horror in the pictures and what was written, to see what German Nazis had done to the Jews, one human being to another, I cried all the way through the exhibition. I, I couldn't believe what, what was possible that a human being could do. I wanted to tell you a little bit more also about the menorah. You see, this is the seven branch menorah. 
Um, the original seven branch menorah was made by Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe, our teacher, and um, it was kept in the Mishkan, in the, in the Mishkan, and it was of pure gold. And the seven branches represent uh, the seven branches and it represent fire and its desire to rise to the source. And the seven branches also represent the seven channels of our spiritual self-expression which can change a person forever. So the next uh, episode was when I was about 26 years old and I had a dream. It was an extraordinary dream. I dreamt I'm in a huge, in a very big hall and lots of chairs in this hall and I'm sitting in the first row Somebody sits beside me and in front of the hall is a kind of stage and on top of this stage is a, is a kind of pedestal. Now on this pedestal are standing old men with long white beards and long white robes and a kippah, a Jewish, a, a couple on their heads and they are dictating something to me. They're dictating, and, and I'm sitting there with a, with a pad and, uh, with, and pencil, and I have to write this down. They're dictating something very, very fast, extremely, extremely rapid, and I can hardly keep up with it. It was so, so fast, but I wanted to understand, I needed to understand everything, what they say and I needed to write from right to left. Now, when I woke up at night, I knew that this was a very, very important dream. I had never dreamt a dream like this be ever before. And I'm a big dreamer, and I always write my dreams down, and this one in the middle of the night I wrote down, but I knew this was an unusual dream. Now, this dream was the third spark that was ignited within me. And I light the third candle. The night after this dream, not the night after, but the Shabbat after, I had the need to go to a synagogue. And I knew where a synagogue was, because I had lived in that part of town, and I knew there was a synagogue. So I went. I would never been before in a synagogue. So I was Somebody guided me to the women's section and I sat there um, beside a woman who shared her prayer book with me and I read, I think, just one prayer which was beautiful. But I couldn't really concentrate because I wanted to see what was going on. You, I wanted to see what the other women did and how they looked like. And so but I knew this, this prayer, it was so beautiful. I wanted to read more. And I asked this woman who had shared her prayer book with me, where can I find this prayer book? And she told me. And then we went outside into the yard after the service. And I asked her again, please, could you write down the title of this book for me? 
and then I saw a man coming up closer to me and he said it's Shabbos young lady to stand right on Shabbos we are forbidden by the Holy Torah I was so embarrassed why I being asked and I went home and I knew now I had to learn much more about Judaism, its laws and customs. Before I go again to this synagogue or to any other synagogue. But what I did was I went to a Jewish cemetery almost every Sunday afternoon and I wandered around around the graves and I read what was written on them, I read the names, the date of birth, the date of death, and I meditated over their lives. And for hours, sometimes, sometimes the guard at the gate, he had to remind me to leave when dark was falling. I think I'm going to light the other spot, the next candle, for the after the synagogue was another spark. So now I knew I had to learn much more. And what happened next was that I met Professor Eugene Heimler in a center for a continuing education in Berlin where he taught social workers his approach. Now his approach is called human social functioning and he developed this out of his experiences in the concentration camps. He was a Jew and a Holocaust survivor. And I was fascinated by this man. That as a Jew and as a Holocaust survivor, he came to Germany to teach young Germans his approach. Now, in one of these classes, one of the students asked him, Professor Heimler, can you not leave us a message? Us young Germans, we need your message. You are a survivor, we need your message. And not long after, Professor Heimler told me that he was planning to write a book with his messages. And he was going to do this in a very unusual way. He wasn't going to write it, but he was going to dictate it onto tapes. And he was wondering where he could find somebody to transcribe these tapes. Now you guess, who volunteered? A few weeks later, I found the first tape in the post and started to transcribe the tapes. Messages is a very, very unusual book. He called it, the title of the book, Messages, a survivor's letter to a young German. And this is the book. Now, this book is a very unusual book. I learned a lot about the Jewish history and what it means to be a Jew. After having read this, I had this need to learn more. And 
my learning led me um, my my wish to um, a, to learn more led me to a very lovely warm Jewish community in London. It was a reform community and I went for every Shabbos service, every Shabbat I went and um, parallel to this um, I, I uh, joined cl classes. Now a uh, the class in these classes I learned more about Judaism, history, customs, laws, as much as possible. And in the end it led me to my reform conversion. And here again I'm going to light a candle because the sparks, all these sparks of Professor Eugene Heimler and his book Messages and the learning and the reform conversion. So, Professor Heimler, I felt, and his wife Lily Heimler um, opened the Holy Ark for me at my conversion ceremony and I felt very, very honored. And very sadly, Mrs. Lily Heimler passed away less than a year later. May her memory be for a blessing. Um, and I had another loss. As a consequence to my um, conversion to Judaism, my father disowned me. He cut off all contact with me and I never heard from him for the rest of his life. His distorted Nazi way of looking at the world even kept him from continuing to love his daughter. So by that time I had um, qualified as a senior lecturer and a therapist in the Heimler method of social functioning and I worked closely with Professor Heimler as his professional and teaching assistant and we had got to know each other very, very well and we felt a very deep spiritual connection and we fell in love. So, on the day after Shavuot, when on Shavuot Hashem marries the Jewish people, and, and so we stood the day after Shavuot under the chuppah, under the Jewish marital canopy, and got married. We lived a very, very happy Jewish life together in London until his passing at the end of 1990. And after his passing, I, I just felt that it was he that had been my home and not England. I did not not need to stay in England and I felt drawn, very much drawn, to go to Israel. And I made Aliyah, I immigrated to Israel, to Jerusalem, Jerusalem um, on Rosh Hodesh Elul in 1994 and made Israel my Jewish home. The next spark was lit. 
Now, two years later, I converted to orthodoxy. And again, that was a, a big and lasting spark to, for me, to my, begin a full Jewish life in Jerusalem. So, I'm in Yerushalayim now, and what can I say? Mir one miracle follows the next. Now, you will be wondering, what happened to the first spark? Because the first candle is not yet lit. Now, I found out about the first spark when I had lived already more than 10 years in Yerushalayim, when my stepmother came to visit me. And she brought me a present. Now the present was an old notebook. But the old notebook was from a time when I was seven years old and I had learned the first letters of the alphabet, all the letters of the alphabet, when I looked through the pages. They were full with letters. And on the first page was written the word Israel. So, why Israel? I looked through all the pages, the letters I had learned, I had learned all of them, but I had not learned the letter R yet. So, Hashem, Hashem had put that first spark into me when I was seven years old. greatest honor and a privilege to, to really hear your illuminating, your riveting story of your life. Thank you. And this book that you've written, Daughter of Abram, which you gave to me and our family, I couldn't put it down. It was it's from your heart and your story is unique and you are unique the daughter actually of a Nazi who converts to author, eventually to Orthodox Judaism and lives in Israel. You are such an example that we can all strive to emulate. Really, it has been something of immense importance and such a pleasure to hear you. And I am so extremely grateful. From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you. And to all our, those who are watching, I would strongly recommend you to get this book, Daughter of Abram. You'll be so inspired. And Miriam, you should just have all of Hashem's blessings. Thank you and so much. much. And we really, I want to Amen. thank you really from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much, Les. Thank you. And I thank you too for giving me this opportunity. Miriam Bracher, if I could ask you, what message would you give to future generations from your unbelievable and incredible life experiences? Well, I think my message is to you is hearken, listen to your heart. 
and follow your dreams. And believe that Hashem prepares the path for you, for us, for everybody's, everybody's path is prepared by Hashem. And yes, there will be obstacles, there are always obstacles on our path, but obstacles are there to overcome and to learn from them. See, there are many mitzvot, and keeping mitzvot also helps us to become better persons, to work on ourselves and to better ourselves. We are here, we the Jews are here, letaken olam b'malchut shaddai. We are here to perfect the world, the universe, in the image of Hashem. Thank you so very, very much. <laughs>